Hi everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about the Electoral College, why we have it, what it does, and what are the recommendations of how to reform the Electoral College, should that be something we decide as a country to do. So before we get started, I want to reintroduce myself. My name is Christine Bird. I have a JD, I have an MA in Political Science, and I'm almost finished with my PhD in Political Science. My personal area of study is the Supreme Court, but today we're talking about the Electoral College. So first, let's talk about why do we have the Electoral College and what is its purpose? So at the founding, back when we wrote the Constitution, the founders, the people sitting in the room talking about whether or not we're going to have a system of government over another system of government, decided that we did not want to elect the president via the popular vote. And they decided that they didn't want to do that because they didn't have trust in the electorate yet. So this is the system that we put in place at the beginning of the United States and it's the, what we have in place today. So what we do is instead of a voting for president, like we don't go to the ballot box and we say, I'm voting for Joe Biden or I'm voting for Donald Trump. Instead, what we're doing is selecting a slate of electors and the electors go meet in a room on December 14th and they decide who the president of the United States is going to be. This has been modified a little bit over time because now those electors are bound by a system called winner take all, which we'll talk about in a minute. And that means that the electors already have agreed that they're going to vote for the person that got the most votes in the state that they come from. You need 270 votes to win the presidency. There are two more reasons for the Electoral College. The first is that they wanted to limit the amount of corruption going on in the United States. The second reason is they wanted to increase the barriers between the legislature and the executive branch. Because remember, at the founding, we were very, very concerned about having a system that was as different from a monarchy as possible. So originally, the framers intended for the Electoral College to serve as a check against the popular vote, meaning that if the people voted for someone that the Electoral College did not agree with, they would veto that vote and vote for the person that they thought would be the best president. So we haven't seen a lot of this in modern history, except for the 2016 election, when there were a lot of calls for the Electoral College to ignore the results of the uh, winner-take-all Electoral College vote and to defect from the winner-take-all system and vote for Hillary Clinton over Donald Trump because she won the popular vote. Another important point is that the Electoral College is part of a compromise between the founders between small states and large states. And when each state entered the union after the original 13 states, there had to be a compromise about how many electors that state was going to bring so that it didn't disrupt the balance of power when we're talking about presidential elections. Um, also, this should go without saying, but I want to drop a footnote here, is that the Electoral College only applies to presidential elections. It does not apply to Senate or House races. We're only talking about the president. Okay, so the next section is what is the winner-take-all system? The winner-take-all system is decided upon by each individual state because remember we have a federal system of government, which means we have a national government, state government, and a local government that all have different jurisdiction over what governmental um, processes that they are in control of. And states are in control of their um, election systems. So we also know that from Bush v. Gore in 2000. That point was reiterated by the Supreme Court. Uh, Bush v. Gore is not precedential, so it cannot be applied in any upcoming election, but that's a video for a different day. So the winner-take-all system means that every state has um, either adopted or not adopted this process, and that means that you as the state, if you are the elector, would vote for the, the winner of the popular vote in your state. So if you're a Texas elector, whoever won the most votes in Texas is who you will vote for in the Electoral College. If you are in California, it's the same thing. There are two states that deviate from this. Maine splits their vote into two, and Nebraska splits their vote. So that's the winner-take-all system. And next we move into what the Electoral College actually does. The Electoral College is actually a group of real people and they are selected by their party, usually par members of a, they're a party loyalist and that's how they get um, to be an elector. One of the most famous electors this year is actually Hillary Clinton is an elector in New York. Whether that was advised, I'll let you decide. But Hillary Clinton is actually an elector in the 2020 election. So in normal periods of time, the elector would go meet together at the Electoral College, they would get into a room and they will cast their votes. 
And usually that's just a formality because we know who won and we know how the votes are gonna go. If we didn't have the winner take all system, that would be a very different pr process. But because of winner take all, we know the outcome. They get in their room, they cast their votes, then that's on December 14th this year. And then we would inaugurate the next president in uh, January of the, the year following the election. So this year, because of COVID and the pandemic, that meeting probably will not take place in person, but it will be on December 14th. So now what we just talked about is that you need 270 votes to win the Electoral College. So if you've been watching the contemporary news for the time I'm recording this video, we are two weeks after an, uh, an election. So you all have seen on TV that they keep having this number flash up on the screen, 270 to win. And you see the pundits on CNN and Fox playing with their magic boards and clicking on all the different states and saying, this state will get Biden to victory, this state will get Trump to victory, and it all comes down to a set of four or five states that we really care about and that really end up being the decisive states in that presidential election. In this cycle, Pennsylvania was very important. It has 30 elector electoral college votes. Uh, Georgia was very important, and I think Georgia has either eight or nine, and then Arizona was also very important. But states like California, we already knew how many electoral college votes they were going to have because we know how California votes. The same with Texas, the same with New York. So we just came down to those couple of swing states, which at this point in 2020 was Florida, which Donald Trump won, Pennsylvania, which Joe Biden won, Arizona, which was called for Joe Biden and called for Joe Biden early by Fox News, and um, Georgia. So... That was the electoral breakdown on this. Um, I'm going to start putting uh, slides up in, on this side of the screen so that you can see the map and the breakdown. The most important thing to remember when you look at electoral college maps is that land does not vote, people do vote. So you might see all of these states that are red and it looks like most of the country is voting for the Republican versus most of the country voting for the Democrat, which would be represented with the blue, but land doesn't vote, people do. So if we look at the next slide, that I'm gonna pop in here, you'll see the population density map, which does show that um, the Democrats did have more votes for the presidency this time. So a couple critiques to the Electoral College are obvious. Number one, we're a democracy, so we think that maybe the popular vote should matter when we're talking about the Electoral College and who should win the, the presidency, right? So why should we just not do this based purely on the popular vote? Who got the most votes? period. So the reason we don't rely on that is because of this compromise we talked about before and the arguments of the founders. The other reason, the pro of the Electoral College, my personal, um, in the pro column for me for the Electoral College, is that it exaggerates a presidential win. So it's not just, did the president win by 4 million votes? Did they win by 3 million votes? Did they win by 200 votes? It's they won by so many electoral college votes, so it makes the win look more exaggerated. And this exaggerated win is actually one of the reasons why the United States has always experienced, up until now maybe, a peaceful change in the presidency. So because it's earlier and easier to concede an election based on the electoral college versus if we had, it, had to count every ballot in the United States, the, the transition is just more peaceful because the person that loses the Electoral College knows that sooner, especially in times like this where we're using a lot of mail-in ba mail -in ballots, and um, that person would generally concede and we'd move forward with the transition team. The con of the Electoral College, of course, is that the popular vote doesn't decide who becomes president, and this is different than many, uh, many countries today. So there is a reform movement happening, but it is not very fast. There is a compact called the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. And what this is, is a group of states who've agreed that their electors are going to issue the winner take all system. And instead they will vote for whoever wins the national popular vote. And this is a contrast to winner take all, which means those electors vote for who won the popular vote in their state. So the electors in Colorado would have only voted for the popular vote winner in Colorado before, but if they are um, part of this compact, then they would be voting for whoever won um, the national popular vote. 
And the reason why this isn't gaining a lot of traction is that it's actually an unconstitutional amendment. So because our constitution is set up with the Electoral College, engaging in this type of uh, compact is probably illegal. And so not recommended. Um, it's on very shaky constitutional grounds. This hasn't been challenged in any court under judicial review. So the status of whether the compact is constitutional is controversial, but in my legal opinion, it is not constitutional. So that's all I have to tell you about the Electoral College today. That was a fast and dirty video. If you have any comments or questions, leave them in um, the description or leave them in the comment section down below, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Make sure that you like and subscribe. You can also follow my work on my academic website. You can follow me on Twitter, and um, let's learn about politics.